second. I think this is my first time ever not having tacos. I was so hungry, I ate them all beforehand. You're such a liar. <laughs> I'm You're serious. A liar. I'm serious. I've got some on the way. They're just not here yet. Oh. I'm, I'm excited for what you got on the way, too. Um, a, I would say it's a little different, but it's not different for me. If, if I'm going to this particular location, that's what I'm going to get. I, I, I agree. I agree with that sentiment because I, I, love, I, I love that location. So, all right, guys. Well, welcome back to um, another rendi rend rendition of um, Taco Tuesday. Um, we have a very special guest here with me today, somebody that I've been, I've been um, trying to get on the show for some time. And um, he's a busy man, so sometimes it's hard to, hard to, to get him to, to come on things like this. So I have Lester Kahn with Agent Pipeline, who um, I work very closely with on a regular basis. So somebody that um, become, a, to me, a really good friend. And um, Lester, thank you for taking the time and coming on with me and Glenn today. Oh, listen, Christian, I'm, I'm glad to do it. I'm glad you wrote me into it. <laughs> it, uh, it just so happens that I, my typical Tuesday at this time, I've got another obligation. So we pushed all that aside so we can join you for some Taco Tuesday. So this will be fun. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. I was glad, I, glad that we talked on the phone before, Lester, but it's nice to yeah. put a name to a face. Absolutely. Well, it may not be nice to put a name with this face. This is the face for radio, but you just work with what you got. <laughs> that's, that's all you that's can do, right? Christian lives by that motto. Trust me. Right? <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to Hollywood with this face, but that's all right. <laughs> there, are, are there that many people in our business that are, that have Hollywood faces? There's not. There's a lot of <laughs> you know, tape on glasses and. Pocket hey, protectors glass. and yeah, you know, pocket protectors. Right. I mean, if you're yeah. going to do it, you might as well do it right. That's right. So, so Glenn, um, wanted to check in cause I haven't talked to you for a little while now. Yes. How are you feeling? Is, is, is the plague lifted? I have officially survived COVID. It was, it was intense for sure. I mean, you, you hear so many stories. You talk to people who've had it before. You don't know what to expect. You know, I am my my two cents. I wanted to throw out there for for you guys too. Anyone who's watching or listening to this, you know, I live a pretty reclusive lifestyle. I don't just look like a hermit. I actually act like a hermit as well. <laughs> so you know, I I didn't really think this was going to be an issue for me because I, again, I. I work from home. My children are homeschooled. That's how it's been for many, many years, even before the pandemic. So, um, and then it was just one of those things where a family member um, that we were visiting with had caught it. And by the time she realized she had it, my entire family had it. Um, and, you know, just down for the count for a solid week. And it's been kind of this slow progression back. Um, so definitely, you know, take it seriously, you guys. If there's anything I could I could really share. But I am feeling better now. I'd say I'm about 95%. Little little congestion still. You might hear it as I'm talking, but yeah, it's it's been a, a trip for sure. Well, I'm I'm glad to hear it because I was starting to get worried about you. I was gonna start I was starting to worry that this was gonna end up being a one person show at some point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you're back. You're more entertaining than I am, so I'm I'm definitely <laughs> glad you're feeling better. I've been down that road, so our family had it for a week last fall, so it yeah. is, it's no joke. I'm glad you're feeling better. Yeah, it is no joke. Thank Lester, you. um, real quickly for anybody, so a lot of people that are that will see this probably might know who you are, or at least know your name. You know, just through you know just through inner workings of the industry. Because I know you've been around a long time in the industry, but for anybody that might not know who you are, because you're kind of you're kind of in the background sometimes, right? You're kind of in the shadows, Damn you know. Um, Batman. Sometimes I operate like an underwriter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I met uh, I met a, I met an agency we work with two years ago, and they literally thought we worked in a dungeon, <laughs> and uh, was happy to see that I was a real person. I'd work with them for like. I don't know, eight or nine years. I'm like, I am glad to finally meet you. 
I remember, I remember when we met for the first time in person last December after AP, yeah. I was like, I was like, oh wow, this is weird. Like, I'm like, this is Lester in person. Like this is, this is <laughs> odd. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope I didn't ruin your your perception of me by actually meeting. <laughs> uh, no, not at all, not at all. Um, but for anybody that might watch this though, and maybe not be familiar with with you or Agent Pipeline, sure. um, give us a quick little introduction, a quick little yeah. bio there. Quick, yeah. like thirty minutes, quick. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, have, we'll be half done. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, you can see my name. I'm Lester Kahn. I have been with Agent Pipeline now for 12 years. So a little bit of background on me. Um, I started in the insurance business, uh, actually selling pre-range funeral and uh, loved it. Have a background in ministry. So that kind of family counselor role really fit uh, my personality well, my skill set well. Uh, so that's how I got into insurance. Uh, migrated over into um, some uh, career, uh, final expense, health insurance, a little bit of Medicare sales uh, with United American. Um, and moved up through the ranks with that company, ended up opening a branch office uh, for them. Went from them to understanding the broader perspective of the industry a little bit. Actually went and opened a general agency. Um, sold that. Um, interestingly enough, I was um, I ran into the challenge of dealing with needy agents. I'm sure you've never heard of that before. <laughs> Wait, what? Needy agents? <laughs> oh, <So, laughs> I, uh, I, I sold that, sold that agency. Um, actually for, for a brief period of time after that, I was a, a branch manager for American Republic as well. Uh, and then moved into the wholesale side with agent pipeline in 2009. Uh, so I've been, this is my 13th AEP with agent pipeline. It, I feel like, I have worked in every market in America. Um, it's not quite that extreme, but I, I feel like I've worked pretty much every state. Um, so I've worked in the Medicare division. I ran our life division for a little while. Uh, currently, I'm a regional vice president responsible for Medicare sales for uh, five states and um, any crossover states in addition to that. So I still feel like I work half the country, but uh, no, I love what I love what I do. I love the process of getting to know agents, their business model, um, sharing um, tips and tricks, um, helping strategize to take wherever they are. Um, you know, the, the, the goal is definitely to, to meet agents where they are and take them where they want to go. I've had the privilege of literally working with agencies from, you know, ground level to the point if they walked outside, they would skin their chin um, <laughs> to where they are running hundreds of agents, thousands of enrollments. Um, we've had the, the privilege to work with some of our largest accounts uh, with Agent Pipeline, and uh, it's been a fun ride. I absolutely love what I do. Um, sometimes it does feel like we're in a dungeon because we're not able to be um, in the field as, as much as I'm used to. So I'm used to the, the eat what you kill mentality of mm -hmm. sales and just being out there and the hustle and the windshield time and everything else. Um, so making the transition to uh, an office position primarily behind the desk, it's, uh, it's an adjustment, but we've, uh, mm -hmm. we've done it pretty well. And uh, we do get out of the office, believe it or not, more now than ever and uh, continuing to do more of it. So thrilled to be able to jump on here with you, Christian, because you're a rock star. I think everybody knows that. And uh, what you're doing in the industry is impressive. So glad to be uh, glad to be able to be a part of it and be partnered with you. Well, thanks, Lester. I appreciate that. Um, and you know, when I when I th when I think about you, I think of somebody that you know I've had the privilege to work with you and Agent Pipeline for a lot of years now, and I've learned a lot, particularly in the last couple of years, from you about just a lot of the back behind the scenes stuff that you don't here talked about, right? Like right. releases, um, policies, processes, time periods, timelines, like stuff that you just don't see talked about or can most ask, people just don't know. Can I ask a quick question before we jump? I know we had a lot of stuff yeah. we want to talk about, but um, Absolutely. Based on, yeah, based on your background there, Lester, I would love to hear, um, you know, I came from the final expense world and you okay. talked about pre-need. And I feel like there's probably a lot of agents out there who don't know 
what the difference is or what maybe they might not even know what pre-need is. I'd love to hear just like a quick synopsis on pre-need versus final expense and okay. how those, those two kind of differ. Yeah, it's perfect. So um, I have a brother who is actually a funeral director. So, um, and, and he actually got into it after uh, I had sold in the funeral home. So uh, pre-need, pre-range funerals are essentially a life insurance product where the client will come in, prearrange their funeral, make their selections of, you know, what their service is going to look like, what, you know, type of casket or vault or whatever, and go ahead and make those selections in advance so the burden's not on the family to do it. Uh, and then they will pre-fund it as well through a life insurance product at today's rate. So even if they pay a lump sum for that pre-range funeral, the interest on the life product is going to pay um, for the cost of the funeral at the time of need. So pre-need, pre-arranged before the actual need happens. Um, the challenge in that market is uh, you are not allowed to solicit business. So if the client or their family doesn't come through the funeral home for whatever reason, you right. cannot make contact. So I, I loved what I, I would still be doing pre-need funeral today had the company I worked for kept their promises. Um, but mm -hmm. in your downtime, um, excuse the pun, but when business was dead, business was dead. I would literally, <laughs> I would, uh, I would literally go on calls with the attendants to, to pick up loved ones that had passed away. Cause I was bored. I had nothing yeah. else to do. I would sit with my feet on a desk. You know, you, you do some marketing, you, you hold some seminars to do some educational things like that. But there was so much downtime and I'm not, I'm just not good at downtime. <laughs> Right. Um, and that was a struggle for me. So I actually um, started to sell some final expense on the side uh, to those people that couldn't afford to prearrange a funeral. I mean, right. if you take a $10,000 funeral on a five-year payment plan, you've got a car payment. Yeah. And a lot of people just, they, they just can't afford to do it. Yeah. So I uh, began doing a little bit of that on the side, um, much more affordable product, expanded my opportunity significantly. I just had to do it while I was outside um of my day job so to speak which yeah, i feel like my entire adult life i've had a day job and a night job <laughs> so, uh, even even today i'm a bivocational minister so i'm still doing some of that family care i'm just not yeah. the policy to them while I'm, while I'm at it so for what it's worth no i i appreciate that explanation i didn't you know i always kind of understood that it was attached basically to that funeral home or, or to the actual services, whereas life insurance, you know, how that money gets spent up to the family. So I think that was yeah. a great explanation for agents who might be listening or, to this or watching yeah. this on how yeah, those they, two could vary. Yeah, they, they vary quite a bit. And, and it is transferable from funeral home to funeral home because the lights of the life insurance company that holds the policy and then pays out to the funeral home. So it's transferable. Um, you know, if you've had, uh, a bad experience. You could transfer for, to a different funeral home for your services, but um, yeah, it's a, it's it's a fun market. It really is. It, yeah. it takes a special type of person to do it, for sure. Not everybody can deal with the death business every day, but um, for me, I love yeah. helping people, regardless of what you know, what uh, market it's in, what challenges they're facing. I just love to help people. Um, so that's what we do. Whether it's with Agent Pipeline, working with agents and agencies to grow their business, uh, whether it's um, through the church, uh, people individually just, you know, develop, developing themselves personally, spiritually. I just love uh, the process of really being a life coach um, and being able to be involved in the process of taking them from A to B, B to C. So I'm sorry, Christian, if I derailed where no, you were going. No, no, no. I, I thought, I thought really that was curious. Great. That was I a great question. More about the pre-need stuff. Yeah. That was, that was good. And and while we were talking, Christian, I had a delivery. Woo! So the crunch wrap. All right. All right so crunch wrap has arrived. Oh. <laughs> so now we can party. <laughs> All right. So so Glenn, we didn't get into what you had today. Oh, so I had a Doritos Locos Taco Supreme. Ooh. Which I feel like that'd be like our official. Like we had like a like a a mascot taco. Look at that shirt, guys. If we had a mascot taco, I feel like it would be that Doritos Locos taco. But now I'm um, just a classic bean burrito here. But yeah, 
Just so be- before before I started my diet, my newfound quest of health. Oh yeah, um, I want to hear about this. By that, the way. <laughs> so um, there there may or may not be a group chat in Facebook Messenger that has eight to ten insurance agents in there. People like Jackie Lacer, our very own Jackie Lacer. People like um, Andrew Lee, Danielle Kunkel Roberts. A lot of really amazing people. Um, in that chat and they're ruthless on me. They are absolutely ruthless. <laughs> so um I missed my workout today and they're like, do you really want it? Do you really <laughs> want it? <laughs> Think of how hard they are on you. They would they would crucify me. <laughs> yeah, that's I was on the same page with you last year. I was like don't put me in that chat. <laughs> Keep me out. I'm I'm happy out here and talking about it. I, way. I so, yeah. need desperately to participate, but I I know me and I will fail miserably. <laughs> so yes, yesterday um, I come into the office on Monday and there was cheesecake left over because the staff Ooh. brought in cheesecake for me for my birthday on fr- on Friday, and I love cheesecake. Cheesecake is like amazing, yeah. and. There's, there's cheesecake left in the fridge and I took a picture of it and sent it in the, in the group chat. And I was like, guys, I want this cheesecake. <laughs> I was like, I need you to talk me out of it. And these messages just come flying through, particularly Andrew Lee. He's just like, he's just, he's just like, he's like, he's like, you're, he's like, you get, you, you have your staff go get you cheesecake. Who are you? P. Diddy? <laughs> Who are you? P. Diddy? And I'm like, <laughs> well, I'm just like, I'm just like dying laughing and, Shout out to Andrew Lee. Um, anyway, um, sorry for getting off the rails there a little bit. <laughs> hmm. And Jackie says, I ate the cheesecake. I did eat the cheesecake. I had one piece. But nobody would needed to know that, Jackie. No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> um, So, Lester, there's a lot that, I, that we can cover with you today because there's so much that you know. <laughs> so I yeah. feel like our regular time, I'm like, okay, we got a, we got a lot to cover here. Um, we can always do part two. We'll just jump in and see yeah. how far we get. I'm, I'm okay. absolutely, absolutely. Um, part twos are, are sometimes necessary. So we're not rushing some of these, but, um, one thing I wanted to ask you about that I, I was fascinated to get your, your opinion on. So in a lot of the Facebook groups, you know, mine, mine included, no different. There's a lot of times that people like to kind of puff their chest out and be like, you know, I wrote 50 apps this week or, you know, just like these absurd, obscene numbers. And some people do, you know, some groups write up t- like huge amounts of business. But like, I feel like a lot of newer agents have the, have they, they, they get the, the perspective and they get the impression that everybody's writing like 600 apps a year in our business. And like, and that's normal. And if they're doing 300 a year, that they're a loser. And like, I just have found that is so far off the rails from reality. And I wanted to kind of get your opinion on to like, what is it? What is typical for an average agent? And why, why, why do you feel like those numbers are inflated like they are? Well, <laughs> it's a loaded subject. <laughs> a, I know. That's a loaded question. Not, not trying to call anybody out, of course. No, like, not it. Well, start saying names. Let's go. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's back up and talk about business. The reason we're all in business. Well, I love what I do. And I, I absolutely love what I do. The reason I do it is to make an income. Yes. And it can't always be about an enrollment number. Well, we're salespeople and we're competitive and we're type A and we do want to brag about our results and our accomplishments. And we should. At the end of the day, I can't compare my results to Christian's results because my cost per acquisition may be entirely different. And if I wrote 50 apps this week because I bought 500 leads, at the end of the day, what was my net revenue difference from a guy that wrote five apps, but he didn't buy a lead? He went and did grassroots marketing and generated business the quote unquote the old fashioned way it's it's not just an enrollment number it's net revenue Ooh, and Ooh, i think we man. also well, jump in there go ahead i mean it's business right yeah net I mean, worth is all that matters key. yeah i mean there's so much that agents don't factor in you know we talked about um 
chargebacks many times yeah. before, um, especially on the life insurance side of the business. I think that's that's one that, again, you might hear someone, you, they talk about how many apps they wrote or how much premium they wrote. But I love that because at the end of the day, it is it is what you keep. And I get, you know, my, from my point of view, my angle, when I get to talk with some of these different agencies and IMOs and call centers, you know, some people will have a CPA, a customer, you know, cost per acquisition. That's crazy to most agents where they're spending mm-hmm. four or $500 to acquire a single client. And they don't care because they're at, they're playing a different game entirely. Right. And then you have an individual agent where if they don't get that acquisition into that one to 200 range, they're not going to, they're not going to make any money. So I, I love that, that you bring that up right away because yeah, it, it's apples to oranges. You can't even compare yeah. the two. It's a completely different game that's being played. And it's, and it's so much easier to scale. And I know this conversation's been had a million times it's so much easier to scale if I have a thousand clients on the books and I've got guaranteed revenue coming in because I can invest, I can hire staff, I can do you know so much more on the marketing end. And I think new agents very quickly become disillusioned yes. of, you know, I'll use Christian and maybe it's not a good example, but because he can take it, you know, Christian did 22 apps this week and I haven't done 22 apps in three months. It doesn't mean you're a failure. It means you're at a different place in your career. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, from the 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 ministry background a little bit, I do a fair amount of marriage counseling. And the biggest mistake you could make is try to run your parents budget when you're 22 years old, just getting married. You're in an entry level position, but you want the RV and the bass boat and everything that your parents have worked the last 40 years to get. It's the same thing in the insurance business. I can't be. Ryan Kimball today. I would love to, but I, it's just not <laughs> realistic. I, 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 one of these days I want to get there, but I'm not there today. So I'm not, I can't compare apples to apples when it's, when it's not. And, and the last thing I want to do is take away my own motivation of hitting my goals. If we're not setting uh, realistic and achievable goals, we're never going to get there. And as soon as you put out this huge enrollment number, and you don't have a realistic game plan to get there, you're going to, no matter what you made, you're going to come home disappointed and feel like a failure. And the statistics don't lie. 80% of insurance agents are out of the business in the first two years in the business. Why? We compared ourselves to the rock star and mm-hmm. 92% of agents aren't rock stars. They're not. But you know what? They can, they can build a credible book of business Compared to most other businesses, the profit margins are obscene, make a fantastic income for their families and leave a legacy business to their children and still feel like a failure because I'm comparing myself to throw any name in there you want to. I'm comparing yeah, myself to Justin right? Yeah. And if, if you're not Justin today, don't try to be Justin by tomorrow. Make a game plan, absolutely, of this is where I want to be in your – Six months in, a year in, eighteen months in, two years in. Yes, let's let's have a strategy to get somewhere and let's dream big. But while we're dreaming, let's understand the steps it takes to get there and let's put a plan in place to do it. So on that note, right. I, I totally agree with you. The failure rate of agents and and there is a lot of I'm comparing myself to someone that I shouldn't be going on. And social media took something that I feel <laughs> like I'm started. What's that? To a new level. Yeah. Well, at the start of my (laughs) career, social media wasn't nearly what it was today. And so I was just kind of blindly figuring stuff out, just literally trial by fire. And it's such a different world now where, you know, I mean, here we are, we're broadcasting, you know, all around the U.S., all around the world to, to people watching us. And so there's a lot more information. So I guess my question would be how many how many people aren't being given the entire scope of, of what this business is, or, or there's a lack of transparency or they're being lied to, you know, what do you think the comparison of agents who come in and they, it's, it's more their own fault for trying to do something and comparing them versus, you know, 
oh, they were fed, they were fed some mistruths or they were misled by an upline. Well, in reality, I think there are very few uh, uplines, whether that is, you know, a local agency, a national FMO. I think there are very few uplines in this business at this point that are going to intentionally lie to you about the opportunity. Uh, there are some yeah. there are some people that I mean, me personally, I would choose not to do business with. But I think the vast majority of the industry today, they're well-meaning, they're well-intentioned, they're they're not giving you pie in the sky. Uh, I, I can take you back just to speak from personal experience. When I started recruiting agents in a career agency and selling the dream of, man, you can make $100,000 in income your first year. Right. I didn't in, I, I didn't intentionally lie. Right. <laughs> right. I showed you what it took True. to do that. And the reality is 95% of the agents we worked with weren't willing to do what it took to get right. there. So mm. nine out of 10 failed entirely, meaning they, they either left the company or left the industry inside of the first 12 months. And it was never because it wasn't possible. It was never because the market wasn't big enough. It was never because there weren't leads available. It was because they weren't willing to put the activity in to do what it takes to do it. Mm. So I think there is, you know, this feeling that people are being misled and, and, and I don't think most of the time, I don't think that's the case. I, I think there's not enough realistic expectations of rate of return, cost per acquisition, return on investment, and, and even less on the lead gen side as the time and effort it takes to get a business off the ground. You're not just, you shouldn't just be working out of your closet trying to make two sales a week and survive. And that's what the statistics tell us are, is happening. The average insurance agent's making less than $50,000 first year. It does not take a lot of business to make $50,000. It does not take a lot of clients. Last but, time I looked, it was $24,000, I thought. Well, I mean, statistics, 85% of them are made up on the spot. <laughs> I looked at a, uh, a $49,000. 49, it depends on what you're looking at, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's going to depend on the market you're looking in too, but, uh, it, it, let's, I mean, either one, is that net or is that gross? If it's right. 50, if it's 50 gross, it's, it probably is 25 net. Right. Um, you know, but I, I just, th I think agents are not, they don't have a business coach. They don't have a mentor in the business. They're just out there trying to do it on their own. And, you know, there are great ways to start in this industry and there are terrible ways to start. And, I think there's a lot of feedback of don't start as an LOA, don't start as a career agent, when in reality, I think you learn the ropes a lot that way. It's not the worst thing in the world. If if you're going to start as independent, which is clearly the best way to end up, um, you know, and so if you're going to jump in, you need a team. You need support system. You need somebody that you can bounce ideas off of, you can bounce strategies off of, that you're consistently and intentionally laying out a strategy to get there. And I think most agents don't have a support structure. Yeah. So question, follow up question to that Lester. Cause I, I, I think that was all right on the money there. Um, why? So when, when agents get into a situation, let's say where they're, they're jumping, they go independent and they don't have that support structure, let's say, and they don't have that mentorship early on, what can maybe a new agent do to avoid that? Like, how do they know how to start out? Like, what's 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 a good way for them to really di differentiate what their best opportunity is going to be? Because a lot of times they don't know what they don't know, right? Like, what 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 advice would you give to a new agent that when it comes to like, you know, what what should I do? Where should I call my home? Where should I start? And everyone's you know, going to be different. But as as we were kind of talking about, this, I was almost thinking like there needs to be a part of your licensing exam that like I feel like it's almost like the state needs to come in and like yeah, yeah like, like just like a one on one like hey here's a quick course that's like bare minimum expectations of how this is all because you know I know I was shocked going from the state exam to reality because it was like two different worlds as a brand new agent, you know? Yes. Yeah. That's, I mean, there's so many different ways to be successful. I don't want anyone to feel pigeonholed into one particular way to be successful. 
But as a brand new agent, you've got the first thing you've got to do is define success. What is success? Am I trying to establish a book of business that that my family can live off of in a year, two years, three years, five years? What's the goal? And what and I think the other question you have to answer is, what am I willing to do to get there? Because I, and every successful person in this business, in this industry is going to tell you there's one key and there's only one key. And that's hard work. If you work harder than your competition, you're going to end up with more business than your competition. Unless you just have a marketing genius who can, you know, sit at home and have all these, I know, all the, all these leads just piling <laughs> up. Uh, it, it, it takes hard work. And I think there's, I think there's a, a lack of appreciation for the, for the elbow grease it takes to be successful. Even if, if I have a hundred leads on my desk today, but I haven't worked leads in 10 years, I'm going to struggle. If it's my first day calling leads, I'm going to struggle. I'm going to burn those leads. Clients are going to be upset with me. I'm going to give, not intentionally, but I'm going to give misinformation because to your point, Christian, I just, I don't know what I don't know. So you, you need a, you need a partner in the business, which can be uh, a local feed on the street partner. It can be a Christian Brendel. It can be, you know, somebody who's going to have those business conversations with you to help you define success where you are today. And, and some of your uh, content, Christian, that you've put out about, you know, that that first client's first goal, first hundred clients is the next goal. Those those are perfect. And that's what an agent needs. And then how do I get there? What's it going to cost me to get there? How much time is it going to take? Am I going to work weekends? Am I willing to work weekends? You know, th so there's just there's some proper expectations that have to be set more than anything else. And probably one of the best pieces of advice I can give anyone in any job anywhere. I, I don't care if you're working for Agent Pipeline. You're working for Christian Brindle Insurance. You are working for yourself. You need to look yourself in the mirror at the end of the week and say, if I was paying your paycheck this week, would I fire me? Mm -hmm. Oof. And if you That's don't have to answer that question, if you can be honest with yourself, failure is, in, is inevitable until you change what you're doing. Whew. I was, okay, say that one more time. I want to make sure I got that. If I was being paid... If your you were paycheck. paying, if you were paying your paycheck this week, would you fire you at the end of the week? Gotcha. So if, if I'm looking at it like I'm an expense to the business, yeah, I'm out. Pink <laughs> flip, guys. It's a tough, today. Let's it's, go. <laughs> it is a it is a tough conversation, but it's yeah. it's reality, and you know I I, I evaluate myself that way on a consistent basis. I wouldn't say that I do it every time a paycheck comes out. Um, but I have those <laughs> tough conversations with myself. I have those tough conversations with my team members because again, it's, it's never, you're not good enough. It's, are you being as good as you really are? And that's the question. Are you reaching your potential? Or are you settling somewhere beneath that potential? And that's the question we, we all have to ask ourselves. If I've made my first 10 sales or if I'm 30 years in and, you know, and I have 10,000 clients. That's, that's, that's really good. Like legitimately though, that, that's, Agreed. that is so true though, because with, especially in the independent world, like you are your own boss, you, you are know, your you, own ability. you don't a... have anybody that's really, you know, greasing your wheels, you know, that's, at, that's, you know, pushing you or guiding you or directing you be like, you know, and giving you tasks to do. You have to kind of figure it out and be a self-starter and 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 that I feel like is such a hard thing for people to grasp like they get this idea that they're like oh I'm going to work for myself it's going to be great I can make my own schedule I can go on all these vacations that's what they're thinking about <laughs> they're not thinking about like they're not thinking about you know it is hours. great yeah, I just thought my it is license. great. I'm gonna sign yeah. up for my next five vacations right now. Right. Yeah, yeah. It, it is fantastic if we'll work as hard as we play. We need to play. Yeah. We need time away. We need to de-stress. When we need, I'm preaching to the choir here. Christian and I both probably fall into the same boat of not taking time off like we should. Yes. We, we desperately need that, and you should play as hard as you work. If you don't work hard, you shouldn't play hard. Yep. 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 Hundred percent. Hundred um, percent. It's really not where I meant that conversation to go, Christian. But it's it's probably it was, the best <laughs> advice. I think it was I great. Give anyone. I think it was great, and and yeah. and people need to. I think people need to hear it because, like, you're 
you at the end of the day, it's your business, it's your responsibility, you know, to make sure. I mean, it's the old Zig Ziglar quote, right? If it's meant to be, it's up to me. That's exactly it. You you you've got to be intentional in everything you do. And time is the most valuable thing you have, right? So yes, I need to invest in marketing. I need to invest in relationships and networking and everything else that goes into this business. But I've got to invest my time as wisely as I possibly can because it's the only thing God's not making any more of time in real estate. Whew. So, you know, that's so true. I've got to budget it. I've got to be intentional with it. And if I mean, how many times do we, you know, I, I take off on Saturdays, theoretically. Um, at the end of a Saturday, do you look back and say, wow, I really feel like I, I accomplished a lot today. Pat myself on the back. And most of the time we don't. We get to the end of the Saturday or it's end of Sunday evening. We're ready to go back to work. And we say, man, where do we can go? Yeah. So we've, mm -hmm. we've got to be intentional. We've got to plan our success. We've got to work our plan. A failure to plan is a plan to fail. And I think that's where most agents, it's not their, it's not their selling ability. I mean, maybe second to that is, is their marketing ability because the hardest part of this industry is finding a client, not selling a client. Mm -hmm. The sales side is easy. I've, I've got to be willing to be intentional with the, the things I've been given. And I've been given 24 hours today to invest into my family, my career, my clients. How am I going to do it? Is that 24 hours get invested into me or did it get invested into growth? So, you know, I've, I've got to be very intentional. I've got to plan my success and I've got to work that plan day in and day out. It's, it, none of this is rocket science. I tell mm -hmm. my team this all the time. Nothing I do is rocket science. I just do the little things well and I do the little things well consistently. That's what I do. Yeah. So true. And yeah. hit it right on the head. Um, Lester, I, I had a question I wanted to ask you that just popped sure. into my mind because there's something that, okay, something I've noticed about you over the years working with you is so, and something that I need to learn more of from you and people in, you know, other, other people in the industry that are good at this too, are like Eric Fierro, Eric Fierro is really good at this. Like you never lose your cool. In a, in, even in a different, even a difficult situation, you know, like if there's something that's going on that might not be ideal, or if it's a tough situation, like you keep your cool and you keep your calm. Where does that come from? Christian, if you had known me as a young man. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> loaded question. Where does, that, where does that come from? So I was the youngest of four boys. There were six kids total. I was the youngest of four boys. I literally scrapped every day of my life up until seventh grade. Every single day. I had a terrible temper. Um, <laughs> terrible I'm shocked temper. actually to hear that. Like I am shocked. To hear I was, that. I was awful. Now I, you know, that was me that I, I, I had an awful temper. I would fight at the drop of a hat and knock your hat off your head to get it started. It, I was terrible. I've matured as you can see from, you know, the uh, inherited gray. Um, I've matured. Here's what I will say. You will never find me way up. You'll never find me way down. Um, I've learned in sales that sales are cyclical. And when you're up, you want to stay and keep that uptrend going as long as you can. Um, and when things are down, you want to cut that thing off as quick as you can. So um, I'm this way in ministry. I'm this way with my family. I'm this way in business. I've had a lot of tremendous successes. I've had a lot of tremendous failures. And I've learned no matter what happens today, the sun is going to come up tomorrow. There's going to be another opportunity tomorrow. You can take, I mean, how many wealthy people have told you this? You can take everything I've got today. I'm going to be back. So I have um, I've done really well in the insurance industry. I have been broke as a joke in the insurance industry. Um, I've ha I've had highs and I've had lows. And a promise is never until that check clears the bank. It's not done. And uh, I remember when I first got started in in insurance sales, and I would leave the clients home. I would give it the cha ching as I'm getting in the car. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, I, it's I I don't know if it's just time or experience or both, Christian. But um, you know, you line up 
in, in, in my line of work, it's different than just selling a client. Not every client's going to buy. And you know what? It's not the end of the day. Um, I'm, ex- I'm a success before I get to that client's home. I'm a success when I leave. A lot of this goes back to my spirituality. Uh, I expect to win in everything I do. I do not expect to fail. But you know what? If I fail, I'm going to get up. I'm going to dust myself off. And I'm going to face the next uh, challenge or the next opportunity with the same gusto that I came through the last one. So you win some, you lose some. That you, You've got to learn to win with grace and lose with grace, right? Um, and part of it's probably my personality too, Christian. If uh, if you watched me watch a professional sporting event, you would get aggravated because I'm, I'm, I'm vocal that <laughs> we don't need a touchdown dance in the end zone, right? Act like yeah. you've been there before. Get up and play the game. Let your... <laughs> Let your uh, your results speak for themselves, and, and that's just that's just how I operate. I teach my kids that. I teach my church that. I teach my team that. Um, expect a win, but don't be a don't be a poor winner and don't be a sore loser. Yeah, that's great. Good steady advice. Eddie, buddy, steady Eddie wins the race. Yeah, right. yes. <laughs> Glenn, I felt like you had you had some a question. I I have like a million questions, but I don't want to dominate taco tuesday well no i was just thinking you know i'm a huge tim ferris fan and he gets he he's a big promoter of stoicism and that's kind of all in line with everything that we were just talking about right there just you know not getting too high and not getting too low because inevitably in this line of business and in essentially any really any business there's going to be ups and downs so i i just thought that was you know sage advice to to just try to stay level you know don't go too high don't go too low well and as you as you deal with i i I guess it's still the same with a client an agent um you know there's a lot of things that can happen that i may not be able to satisfy the want today it does not mean i won't be able to satisfy the want tomorrow Mm. but i've responded poorly I will not have the opportunity to satisfy the need tomorrow. Yeah. If I stayed professional, stayed kind, stayed empathetic, the odds of having an opportunity to do business with that individual in the future are really, really high. So yeah. that's uh I've I've been pulled through my difficult times in life. <laughs> and uh I think that is what's helped me temper my temper. It, the, so can I hope I hope you don't mind me sharing this story, Lester? But like the reason why that and and, I, and I've 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 the reason why that comes to my mind is like I think of because before you were de- you before you were dealing with me as much as you do you're dealing with my dad. Yeah, my dad is not the easiest character sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I know he's not watching this. Your dad's a cream puff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's uh, he he is fun. He's he's fun. You know what? Your dad knows what he wants and he knows how to get it. Yeah, and I can appreciate yeah. that. And and you know my my dad, you know if, when he like if he likes you, you know he'll joke with you. You know he's 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 a fun person to talk to. But when he's upset about something, he you know he's upset. You know kind of person. Um, and like I remember when I first got into the business, I don't even remember. You know because we we were we were working with Agent Pipeline. I don't even remember who, you know, the, our, our, our rep was at the time, I could not tell you. Um, and sometimes he, like, I, 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 he would just like come unglued about like little things. And one thing I noticed about the reps that really, you know, worked well with, with us and with him, they just like were accommodating, you know, very, you know, like, like you said, very level headed. There were some over the years, not, I don't think with agent pipeline, maybe with other groups, but like they would go back at him and be, you know, and, and it just made it so much worse, you know, and there's a lot of, yep. there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of Bob Brindles out there, right? Like <laughs> in, the, in, in our, in our insurance business space, you know, like they, they're, they've been successful. They built a business up, you know, and they, they have, they have um, a sense of, you know, they, they value you, their time, they value, yep. you know, and so I, I know, I think it takes a special type of person to be able to just be like, no, I understand, you know, I understand and I'm going to accommodate and I'm going to help put the fire out and everything like that. And so um, I know I probably wouldn't, I would have a harder time, <laughs> you know, responding in, in maybe the appropriate way. 
I I would I would think Christian that your dad and my dad were very similar. My dad was extremely strict. There was never um, you never wondered where you stood. Mm-hmm. We always said about my dad yeah. that he had the gift of truth, but he missed <laughs> the gift of tact. <laughs> So, you know, uh, dealing with, with my dad, which was my hero. So I don't want to, you know, sound like I'm putting my dad down, but he just, man, there was, there was no gray. It was black and it, or it was white. And if he did not like you, you knew it. And if he liked you, you knew it. Yeah. And, uh, so I relate to your dad much the same way I did to my own dad. Um, a lot of similar, uh, values and, and things like that as well. Yeah. So. Uh, at the end of the day, what helps me, I mean, everybody's got difficult clients. We just have to keep in mind that they're the client. Yeah. As business owners, we don't like to hear that the customer's always right. The right. customer's mm-hmm. always right. The customer yeah. is always right. And I may have to tiptoe around the conversation and go back when I know they're absolutely wrong and find a solution mm-hmm. for them that makes them feel like they got their issue resolved and didn't get their their ego damaged in the process. <laughs> um, and sometimes that's tricky. Um, but I've I've swallowed responses with uh, with agents quite a number of times. But you know what? They're successful. They built successful businesses. They they the the more successful you become, the more the more demands are put on your time. You're you're not going to catch executives that are just you know laying around in the in the employee lounge, they're getting things done. Time is valuable. They don't have time to just sit around and chat and, and, you know, do what we may have done when we started out there. The, the further you go, the higher that ladder of success you climb, the more demands put are put on your time. Sometimes you're going to come across a little uh, gruffer than <laughs> you may have uh, ordinarily, but I, I want, I want people that work with me to know that I care about them first as a person. I yeah. care about their business. I want to see their success. Uh, and at the end of the day, I learned a really, a really good lesson from Ryan Kimball. He told me one time, Lester, they don't have to be your best friend to make you money. Mm. True. So, so true. You know, client doesn't have to be your best friend to sign an app. They need coverage and I need clients. So we can work this out and meet in the middle. <laughs> right? can figure this out. Okay. I can swallow my pride and still do business with someone that I may not, I may choose not to hang out with on the weekend, but we can still do business together. Yeah. You know, um, one question I had for you, Lester, kind of when, when Christian and I were, were brainstorming about topics, um, that we could discuss with you and stuff that I felt like you might be able to bring some insight to the table, you know, I feel like there's a lot of agents out there who get caught in the, they're, you know, a lot of them, I think, assume that they have to create an agency. Mm-hmm. And, you know, personally, after being in the industry, as long as I have, I feel like a lot of times jumping into starting an agency is just a huge trap where you could be just a solo independent agent, you know, or, or maybe you have one agent that helps you you know, maybe you have one LOA agent, for example. I mean, I know some really successful agents who've built very small where it's either just themselves or maybe they have one or two other agents that work underneath them. And so I guess I would be curious to know what would your advice be to someone who maybe they've been successful as an agent for a couple of years and, and now they're, they're, they see that that opportunity of starting their own agency, you know, when, when do you think the right time for an agent to start an agency? And when, when do you think an agent should, should not start an agency? This is such an awesome topic that we could spend the rest of the night on that question. <laughs> alone. Yes. So I will try to give you, yeah, I'll try to give question. you a concise answer. Um, but here's the reality. And, you know, I think one of the best lessons anyone can learn in business is to stay in your lane, right? Not everybody is, has the same ability, has the same skill set, And that is, that is perfectly fine. I'm not trying to be Glenn. I would probably fail miserably. I'm, I'm not, I'm not Glenn. I'm just not, you know what? I'm going to go home tonight and I'm going to be okay with that. 
So what I've discovered is most really good salespeople are really terrible managers. That's just yeah. the way it works. That is not mm -hmm. always the case, but typically as a really high type A salesperson, you're not the best in managing yourself, your time, your organization, your schedule. And to think that that's just automatically going to translate to running an agency, building a team is a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. So frankly, not everyone can do it. I know really, really, really good personal producers that have tried to transitioning over into duplicating what they do into a team and fail miserably. Not only do they fail with their team because they're they're not teachers, right? And if you don't have a teaching skill set, you you can do it. Some of it will rub off through osmosis, but it's hard and and it's not as fun if you're trying to teach somebody who just isn't a gifted salesperson. So that's a struggle. If you're if you're not organized, it's really hard to help a team be organized if they're trying to rein you in all the time. Yep. So really, really high, just naturally gifted salespeople typically struggle building a team. Doesn't mean you can't do it. Leadership is recognizing your strengths and weaknesses putting people around you that know things and can do things that you don't know and can't do. So if you can, if you can continue to personally produce and build a downline and get somebody on your team who is better geared towards that organizational teaching side, mm -hmm. you're going to be able to partner together and find success. I've watched agencies with two principals, one, a super high type, a uh, salesperson relationship builder, the other, the exact polar opposite administrative operations guru yep. and they've built a dynamite organization i've watched agents you know think that the next iteration of their career has to be to build a downline of 100 people stop selling and become so frustrated with themselves that they get out of the <laughs> Christian, <laughs> they're not good <laughs> people Sorry, but bad, bad COVID coughs. Still. Yeah, <laughs> terrible, right? <laughs> but if you if you get that thrill and fulfillment from selling, and you just stop selling, yeah, you're gonna hate your life, and you just yep. you don't want to do that to yourself. Find what you're good at and do it. Build a team around you that's good at what they do and are fulfilled at what they they do, and that's a team. Not everybody can be the point guard. Not everybody can be the quarterback, but somebody's got to cross the cross the goal line. I mean, I, so much great stuff you share there. I think the like what's really attractive, I feel like, when you look at an agency is the model can scale, right? You can have 100 downline agents. You can have 100 LOA agents, and you can, you can scale. Whereas if it's just you or just you and one other agent, you know, there's only so much business that you can really consume. Now, I think there's models where you can be more efficient with how much you produce, um, but I think that's kind of the the fish hook that everyone sees is like, man, I, well, I could go to 10 million if I had, you know, 20 agents like, like me that, that could produce X number of apps per year. But, um, you know, there's this Gary V clip that I just saw where he was talking the, the, he gets asked this question and he's, he's like, the question is, how do you go from $1 million in revenue to $100 million in revenue? How do you make that jump? And he said, he's like, there's no, he's like, there's no piece of software. There's no algorithm. You know, there's nothing that you can buy. Uh, it all comes down to people. Like there's only one way that you grow that big and it's through people. And so I think that's, that really is a huge piece of it that I think people don't understand, like managing people. Again, this is all I do every day. I have a, a team of almost a hundred people who fall under, you know, my company uh, roof. And so like it, it's something I didn't really understand for a long time. Like how, when you grow, how that all works, how do you manage all that people? How you have to have, you know, obviously I can't personally manage a hundred people. So I have to have, layers of management. And then I have to have people who kind of balance the other side of the house. And so you kind of have to structure this whole thing. And I've had to bring in so many people to help me 
And I think it does come back to self-awareness, right? I think you really have to know what are you good at and what are you bad at? Focus on what you can do well. Don't do what you don't do well and find someone who can compliment, you know, where you're, where you're bad. You're, you're exactly right. There's so much talk, you know, when you, you talk about personal development, self-help, however you want to say it, there's so much talk and focus on identifying your weakness and improving it. And I, I think it's the, I think it's the complete opposite way to grow. Focus on your strengths and what you're good at. You're yes. naturally gifted that way. Do what you're really good at. And, and double find down. someone who is good at what you're bad at. They will make you better just by being around them. But if all you do is focus on what you're terrible at, you're going to become really frustrated. Like really frustrated yeah. trying to learn yeah. things that you're just not wired to do. So yeah. find the people that are. Yeah. Partner, hire, whatever you've got to do and put those people in place and give them the autonomy and the freedom to do their job without you looking over their shoulder. Yeah. I've, I've totally tried it both ways. I've, I've early in my career, I got hammered with that advice, Lester of spend an hour a day focusing on your weakness and it, it'll, you'll make it stronger. And like, I just, I kept trying, you know, the things that I didn't like to do, which again, I'm more of the salesperson, right? Like my, that's my natural personality. I'm not an administrative person. I'm not assistant, like, you know, the balancing the books, that sort of stuff. That's, that's not my strength. And so instead of painstakingly trying to learn it all and, and to be better at it, I just got to the point where I was like, nope, and passed it off to someone else that I could try it do it for me, you know? made a huge difference for me. And this also, um, Chris over at Lead Concepts, I feel like he is like the embodiment of that. He like brought someone in to run the business and then he's like a free bird and he just gets to do what he loves. And I'm just like- He loves his job. Yes, I'm like, damn, that's it. So Chris, Chris came to our office and did Taco Tuesday a couple months ago. And so he comes into the office and he's like, He's like, he's like, all right, I'm going to bless you right now. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, and so we're sitting in our conference room, you know, and um, he's like, he's like, he's like, he's like, those two girls up front, what do they do? I'm like, well, I'm like, they, they take care of clients. He's like, so retention. He's like writing all this on the board. I'm like, where are we going with this, Chris? He's like, that person in the back, what do they do? I'm like, well, they're an agent. They sell, they, they make sales. What this person do, that person do. And He's like, he's like, what do you do? I'm like, well, I'm like, well, I wear a lot of hats. He's like, you wear a lot of hats. He's like, look at me, look. <laughs> he's like, he's like, what, what do you do every day? So I'm, I'm going through. I'm like, well, some days I have to do this. Some days I have to do that. I do this, do that. And he's like, he's like, he's like, that's. He's like, he's, I'll do my Chris Weir impersonation. I hope he doesn't see this. He goes, he goes, that's your problem right there. That's <laughs> Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and. He, and he, he, it, he did this hour long like teaching session on the whiteboard for me yeah. and it was transformative really like it was like very eye opening to me to be like okay i believe it i need to do one thing in the business like i need to have one role and ever since then i've been obsessed with like structuring out the company in a different way and we're not there yet you know we're still high we still need more pieces more people um but yeah i mean it's just you can't do everything and be successful at anything, you know? And exactly. that's, that's, I feel like agents can go years and years and years before they realize that. I wish I learned that five years ago. Yeah. Same. Yeah. You can, you know, another quote that fits this so well is you can do everything. You just can't do it all at once. Yeah. You know, I like that quote. As men, we try though. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's the truth. We are not multitaskers. No. <laughs> um, I'll give you. I'll give you an illustration of that. I know you got to wrap this up, Christian. But if your if your wife is talking to you while you're watching the football game, <laughs> it doesn't work. No, my wife. My wife knows, and my team knows this. If they walk into my office and I don't stop what I'm doing and turn and look at them, they don't talk because they know I'm not paying attention. <laughs> That's so true. So if my wife hollers at me while I'm watching the football game, it does not exist and she knows it. 
<laughs> if I turn and look at her and the volume is still on on the football game, I'm not listening. The TV goes off. I turn and look at her. And now I'm listening. We don't multitask. Men do not multitask. Mm-hmm. A woman can drive down the road, put her makeup on, read the newspaper, smack the kids in the back seat, get them all to school <laughs> doing their homework. They're geared for it. We are not. We do one thing well at a time. And it's yeah. it's okay to embrace that and do one thing well at a time. So it. good. So many, so many gems from this episode, I feel wow. like. Um, I want to respect both of your times. Um, because I know that you're both busy people. And um Lester, I just wanted to say thank you for coming on and doing this because I know I'm, I'm glad to do it. We'll have to do it again. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, so what we one thing we do every week, Lester, um, is we do final thoughts at the end of Taco Tuesday, kind of just to kind of wrap up the episode. Um, I'll, we, we, let's start. We can start with you. Any final thoughts that you want to leave the audience with? Well, I would just say this. I mean, we've had a lot of conversations around success. Um, Your level of success is not my level of success. Mine is not yours. Don't try to be anybody but you. Be the best you can be every single day, and success will take care of itself. Be intentional and go get it. There's nothing holding you back but you. That's great. That is great. Um, Glenn, final thoughts? Probably would go back to that stoicism you know, conversation we had earlier, just, I keep thinking about like, I've had some of the highest highs of my life in this industry and also almost equivalently some of the lowest lows of my life. Um, and so I, I just feel like I've gotten a lot better over the years and I think it just kind of came with experience, but man, I wish I could go back early on and, and tell myself that coming in as a new agent, like, Hey, you know, there's going to be, you're going to make, an insane amount of money some days and then you're going to wake up and you're going to lose an insane amount of money some days and everything in between. So, um, yeah, I think, I think that's a really valuable tool if, if you can master that as an agent. I love it. I love it. Um, give us, give us your, bless us Christian, like Chris. Bless, bless you. Bless you. Bless yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think for me is, um, I feel like one thing that I'm starting to learn more and more, and I'm starting to build my business into a way to kind of reflect this is me, me working 15 hours a day is not intuitive of what's great for my company. And me trying to do six different tasks of six different people throughout the day is not intuitive of what's best for my company. Um, I feel like if you're trying to grow an agency, I think that advice that 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 Lester gave, you know, earlier about finding people that fill the hole in the gaps to kind of help out with things that you're not good with is the best piece of advice I think that you can get in business in general. Like I I've, I've learned that a lot. You know, there's been people that I've hired in the office here that like now I don't know how I, I lived without them, you know, um because they do s- certain things so fantastically well that when I was doing it, it was just mediocre in comparison. And so I think guys surround yourself with people that, you know, fill in the gaps, right? Like Medicare has gaps, right? You got to fill in the gaps. Your business has gaps. Fill in the gaps, right? Right. (laughs) Um, So yeah, that, that would be my final thoughts is just, you know, embrace getting help where you need it. I, I really like that. And I think, I think that's, there's a lot of wisdom there. Love it. It's good. Well, gentlemen, thank you both so much for yeah. taking the time. Um, last year. Thank you. And we'll have to do it again soon. Um, guys, we'll be back next Tuesday. Um, don't stop eating your tacos and um, have a great week. Don't stop. <laughs>